in many countries across the world. Joining me now via Skype is author and historian Professor Hugh McMillan, who's written a number of books and papers of the ANC years in exile. Prof, thanks very much for joining us and uh, welcome to the program. Um, Thank you. Yes, so uh, we started chatting a little bit earlier on and uh, you began by explaining that uh, you were never a member of the ANC, but you spent a lot of time in the company of ANC members. Yes, I think I should explain that I was a young lecturer in the University in Swaziland in the early to mid-1970s. And uh, my, my connection with the ANC in exile really came through my students. And one of them is still prominent in, in the ANC, that's Lindy Vizicili, who's the Minister of International Relations. She was a student in Swaziland in the, it's around about 74, 75. And that, that was a connection, a contact that I made. And then it was around about that time that Thabo Mbeki, as then quite a young but prominent member of the ANC in exile, came to Swaziland through Maputo, which was now possible for the ANC members to come into Swaziland um, through Mozambique, which was just becoming independent. And he was beginning to try to reorganize the ANC underground inside South Africa through Swaziland. And he's working very closely with other people that I also admired very much, like Stanley Nabazola, um, you know, who was, who, who was long-term based mm. in Swaziland. So this is how my connection with the ANC in exile began. And uh, I think I was one of, in Swaziland, quite a small number of people who might describe as yeah. sympathizers with the ANC who were prepared to help out in certain ways by offering safe houses and things like that. And I stayed in Swaziland for a few years, and then I moved on to Zambia, where I took the history department in Zambia, and that was a different situation because um, the ANC was based in Zambia, the headquarters was there, most of the leadership were there in Zambia. And uh, I, I think I, I had contact, not necessarily very close contact, but I, I got to know most of the um, leading members of the ANC, including Oliver Campbell, of course, who was the leader and, and somebody who I think everybody had huge admiration for the range which he was able to keep the ANC and exile together in very difficult and dangerous circumstances All right, so in some bad states throughout this time. Tell me a little bit about uh, the type of organization the ANC was in exile. And I would imagine that the cultures were different in the different countries. But what kind of an organization was it in exile? Does it re resemble the, the ANC that we know today? Uh, not really. I, I think there's quite a lot of difference between the politics of liberation and the politics of power, as a, a prominent member of the ANC explained to me quite recently. Um, I, it, clearly, the, the situation of members of the ANC in exile was very difficult because they were always under enormous pressure. They were under enormous pressure from the apartheid regime. They often had difficulties with the host nations, even Zambia, which was basically sympathetic towards the ANC, wasn't really very keen on the ANC having, for example, military um, people based in the country. But there was a lot, a lot of pressure on, on the ANC. One aspect of the ANC, you know, so which people tend not to know at all or remember at all, is that the ANC was in some ways a welfare organization. There were, you know, there were probably about, in the end, about 10,000 people who were in various states, frontline states, and um, places like that, and they there, who were really dependent on the ANC. They were supported by the ANC. The ANC provided them with housing, um, education, uh, a, a basic minimum stipend. So well, that's an aspect of the ANC in itself which I think people tend to forget, that it was looking after people. And in some ways that was um, the, 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 part, the element of the ANC which impressed me very greatly. Um, in Swaziland and Zambia, there wasn't so much military activity that was mainly uh, the military, but mainly based in Angola. All right, so a caring organization in exile. Then yes. I wonder, what was, what was the host nations like and host societies like in taking in ANC members? I, I think that countries like Zambia and Tanzania and, and also Swaziland, in fact, took very great risks by hosting the ANC at that time. It took great risks, but if you look at uh, the record of President Kawinda, for example, they were prepared to take risks but within limits. Um, in terms of the Lusaka Manifesto in 1969, 
Zambia and, and Tanzania both basically said that they would support the ANC as a liberation movement. They would provide a home for the ANC as, as a liberation movement. But they didn't really want to become involved in direct confrontation with South Africa. It was really too dangerous for them uh, militarily um, to, 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 to actually confront um, South Africa. Another thing you have to bear in mind at this moment is that for a lot of the time, right up until 1980, the priority for the frontline states was the liberation of Zimbabwe. And then up, uh, um, uh, South Africa was significant, but it, it, the ANC took really second place um, to the Zimbabwe liberation movement. The, the priority, the urgency, was, was, was to achieve the liberation of Zimbabwe. And, um, yeah. All right. There was a, a great connection between uh, the ANC's uh, military wing and uh, Zapu's fighters at one time. Well, there was, yes. I mean, the, the Wanky and Sepulido campaign, 1978, uh, were joint military ventures by the ANC and Zapu. And um, these were, on both sides, heroic ventures. Um, I think it's often forgotten how many members of both the ANC and of uh, MK and Zapu died fighting in, mm-hmm. in Zimbabwe, in Rhodesia Zimbabwe, in, in, those, in those two campaigns. Many others were taken prisoner. Others um, took refuge in Botswana and even in Botswana. The people, including Pitani, were actually imprisoned in Botswana for a year or so before they were allowed to return to Zambia. Now, I have huge admiration for the people who took part in those campaigns. It's now quite a long time ago. We're talking about 50 years back, and there are not so many um, survivors, veterans of those campaigns. But they were hugely important. And I think Chris Harney correctly said that, that although those campaigns might have appeared to be not successful militarily, they had a huge psychological impact. And he actually saw a, a, a connection between the right and civil campaigns and the emergence of the black consciousness movement around about that same time in the late 60s. It was an inspiration from MK to the black consciousness movement. All right. Okay, perhaps a final question. 107-year history. There was the ANC before it got banned and went into exile. Then there was the exile years. How do you think the party changed as a result of having to go to exile? Were there lessons learned? Did it reformat? What kind of organization did it become, do you think? Oh, there certainly were lessons learned, and it did reformat. One important um, point, of course, is that the ANC went into exile as a multiracial organization, as the Congress Alliance, separate organization for African, white, colored, and Indian people. But in 1969, in the Moraboro Conference, the ANC became, you might say, non-racial, open membership to members of all race groups. And then in, through the Cowboy Conference in 1985, the leadership positions in the ANC were also open to people of um, all races. So that, that's a major transition which took place um, through exile. I, I, I think one of the reasons why I wrote the book that I did write and did the research to write it was that I became a little frustrated in the late 90s, early 2000s by people saying, oh, there are things wrong with the ANC government, in government. These must be attributed to exile. But the problem is excellent. Mm. And I, I didn't really agree with that. I, I, I greatly admired the anti nexon and, I, and I, I thought that whatever problems might have been perceived in the anti government didn't really come from extra. They came rather from, um, which happens to any government that's in power without much opposition, that there are temptations in office. And I think that some, some people fell for those temptations. All right, Prof, we're going to have to leave it there. But thanks very much indeed for your insights uh, uh, today and uh, giving us your time. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much, Peter. All right.